Good evening, everyone. I'm John Cunningham. I'm glad you took time out of your schedule to be here. I'm glad everyone is practicing the safety that we've been asked to do by wearing their mask. So I'm going to give an introduction of why this committee was formed. The city of Edwardsville has organized a committee to aid in listening, educating, and engaging the public in race relations and equality in Edwardsville. The committee consists of John Cunningham, president of the Edwardsville NAACP, Gene O'Brien, owner of New Leaf Counseling, Mental Health, and Trauma Counseling, Brittany Johnson, the editor of the Edwardsville Intelligencer, and on my far left are Mayor Hal Patton. The committee's mission is to listen to Edwardsville residents, employees, and interested parties with a goal of identifying racial inequity in policy, procedure, and our systemic impl implementation within city administration of services or within other aspects of community educational implementation of anti-racism racism programs within our community and schools, educating our community to the realities of racism and the remedies, additionally working to increase resident engagement in community equity activities and all levels of political participation to develop a permanent committee which will be responsible for ongoing oversight of the city's implementation of equity recommendations. We'll regularly reevaluate re and address, readdress ongoing inequities and will continue efforts towards community educational programs. Program. The mask keeps getting in my mouth. <laughs> So we're glad to see all of you taking time out of your schedule again to be here. Uh, the mayor will give some idea of the format that we will follow tonight. Is there anything any one of you all want to say before we turn it over to the mayor? Well, thank you, Mayor Pat. Thank you, John, and welcome to all of you here this evening. Um, this is uh, part of our efforts to address race relations and inequalities in Edwardsville. Uh, many of you might have already heard or seen the questionnaire that we have online. It's a questionnaire that this committee put together. We all submitted uh, questions and asked uh, for a summary so that we could keep it to a reasonable amount, but we've already received over 200 uh, responses to those questionnaires, uh, very thoughtful responses. So we will be using that information. We will have three public sessions like we're having tonight. Uh, we wanted it to be more of a round table where we could all sit together and communicate. We apologize for being up on a stage. We don't want to intimidate or make anyone feel like they can't tell us something. Uh, we want to be like neighbors, you know, be open and be thorough in uh, what you want us to hear. But we'll do three of these sessions and the other two after this may be at a different venue. We may do a Zoom meeting or somebody mentioned do it at the bandstand at the park. Uh, others mentioned you know, city chambers if uh, we can do so safely with the COVID environment that we're working through. Um, tonight's forum is being taped. We are being taped, you are not, okay? The mic down here, the audio will be recorded and you are welcome to give your full name or just uh, address yourself as an attendee. Uh, we would like to know um, ba your, your place of origin, if you're from Edwardsville or if you're from another place in Madison County, that input would be helpful. Um, unfortunately, you know, we're going to work hard to gather information from Ed Edwardsville residents. We'll get some surrounding community uh, opinion, but we're going to put together a plan for Edwardsville and we are going to share all the data that we collect. There are other communities that would like to see some of the things that we're doing and uh, in some ways 
use those as examples for what they can they can work on. Um, but that being said, just open yourself up. Some of the questionnaires, if you haven't had a chance to fill out the questionnaire, I encourage you to go to the city's website or Facebook page, and uh, it'll be under uh, racial uh, equality um, on that web page. The questionnaire is very thorough, and you can give responses uh, to write out exactly what you want to say. So if you speak tonight, and like most of us in public office, if you'd like to fine-tune a sentence or two or wish you would have said more, uh, there's an opportunity on that questionnaire to say as much as you'd like. Uh, but we really want this to, to be open and be easy and uh, be something that we can use to solve the problems. Um, I have a little theme to my effort here um, with the city in particular, and I've come up with after watching, you know, of course we all saw the murder of George Floyd, and then we saw the response in some communities um, and then we saw the response in our community where there were protests, but there were peaceful protests. There were a lot of signs and there's a lot of energy to do something about racism. So we're taking this opportunity to really look into Edwardsville. I can tell you as mayor, um, I haven't looked at this issue closely enough. Obviously when you have 500 to 1,000 people protesting in the middle of our community and, and wanting more action, um, there wasn't enough action to begin with. But I have worked hard, as I've mentioned to this group and to many of others, to make sure we had an excellent community, a safe place uh, to raise a family, a good educational system, uh, which I've been very supportive over the years. Uh, we try to have nice neighborhoods and good parks and lots of activities for everyone to participate. Um, I'll go into some of the detail later of what we work on, but I just wanted to give you uh, the, the quote that I have that I've been revolving in my mind and with our city staff is, we all have a responsibility to end racism. And if you think about that, every day when you wake up, what am I gonna do today? Because I've talked to some of my African American friends and that's what they deal with every single day. Every single day they get up and they have to make a decision of what they wear, where they go, who they hang out with, where they shop, etc. And you know, when you put yourself in that position or in those shoes, it really means a lot to say that we all have to do something and we have to work together to accomplish that. So with that, um, committee members, any additional ideas? Brittany? Sure, sure. Yeah. I just wanna share with you guys that um, as the editor of the newsroom, our model there is to educate and inform the community. Um, but a big thing as a journalist is first you have to listen. So that's what personally I'm here to do is not only a journalist but as a resident of the community just to listen to what you guys have to say um, so we can use our platform to uh, educate some of the community members and the community as a whole um, on some thoughts, some concerns, and maybe even uh, analyze and therefore put maybe some answers um, out there through our platform. But it first comes with listening so feel free to, to say whatever you guys wish tonight. Jean? I just wanted to add to I was just going to add on a comment from what Hal was saying that we need to wake up and attend to this as an issue a daily issue from now on for those of us who haven't been um, and it crossed my mind to just tag on that it's like brushing your teeth you do it every day <laughs> to fit it into our lives. Excellent. So um, the mic is open. Again, uh, those of you who have something that you'd like to share with us, it could be a story, it could be advice, it could be a question, it could be a best practice. Um, we're, here, we're here to listen and, and engage all of you and you guys to engage us. So please don't feel like it's an intimidating environment. I'm, I'm sorry that we're up on stage and it has to be with mask on and distancing, but we, we really wanted this to be an easy talk session, so to speak. So whoever wants to break the ice. I can face the crowd, so I do that. Evening. Good evening. I see you. Evening. Okay, here we now. Okay, evening. My name is Stanley Huddleston. I'm a longtime resident of Edwardsville, Illinois. Been here about 30 plus years. And I have a recommendation for the community. Intelligence is ability to adapt to changes. So, we're all intelligent. 
We understand that. So it's our ability to adapt to these things that we're looking at. Because that's why I recommend that we think about the non-fruit of spirits. I'll give you some of the quotes that they have. Self-control. Kindness. Compassion for love. Because once you leave your home, we're all involved in your community and outside your community. So there, we should not be shocked at any culture shock in this city because we know each other. We've been here together. We do business together. We go to school together. We shop together. So all things taken to be in this community is together. One common goal is to help each other to move forward in a calm understanding because chaos brings problems. And we've been watching television. We see all things in our own small community that it should not happen because we have a cosmetic community. We have a good looking community. You know, you go other places, you got chaos all around. You wake up every morning, you hear violence at your front door. Wherever you go, there's violence. But in Glen Carbon, Ayersville, we don't have that. We have a low sense of uh, insecurity. We should be safe. We should wake up because once you rise out of your bed, when the sun does, you have a challenge to do your part as a citizen because it's important. Because if we don't come together as citizens and stop all the chaos together and do this in a calm manner, well, we're going to have problems still because we're intelligent, as I said before. There's a reason for us to fight among each other because of what we don't have and what I have. You know, as Warren Buffett said, you must read 15 minutes a day to be smart. You pick up a book and do something, you may learn something in 15 minutes a day. You see why you're around here. Why do you have a brief moment in history to be here? You know, and there's a movie I was watching, and her name is Temple Grandin. And who she is, she was artistic. And her aunt had a cattle ranch, so she went there every summer and visited her aunt. So what happened to Temple Brandon, she observed all the animals. She just looked at them, laid out there in the field, checked them out, watched everything they did. She said, huh, there are certain things that they do together that makes them calm down together. So that's what I'm asking of us citizens tonight. Let's go with this thing with intelligence, because we're all smart. Now, there's not a person that don't understand what intelligence means. Because she said here, I do not want to leave Earth without contributing something to it. It's my responsibility to do something to make the world better. And we have a very cosmetic community, as you see. Nice buildings. Everything you see is all shiny and pretty. Well, I just laid back, so we think, think there's no trouble around us until trouble happens. Then you get all upset, all out of shape. Because I've been in the military. I was in culture shop when I got there. I've seen all these things around. I'm like, wow. You know, this is new to me. So I'm asking the leadership, the citizens, to use your intelligence to come together better. Because we're here for one thing, to live and to thrive together. You can't have everything. Everybody have a chance to move forward. You can't get the whole pie. Just get your part of it, and we all be happy eating with ice cream and enjoy the beautiful community that we have here. Because it's real. I've been here 30 some years. I grew up in a small town, rural Exeter here. I didn't know what areas it was, so I came over here, and I wow, a nice community. I live here. It's thriving, and it's well-being. So we should understand. We should get along. Compassion is a very good thing. So we understand who we are, where you be, and where you got to go. So I thank you for your time and listening. And let's just calm down and understand why you are the citizens of Brazil, Illinois. <clears throat> thank you, Stanley. Um, I know, I've known Stanley for years, and he can really articulate and speak with his mask on. I thought I heard clearly 80% of his normal clarity. So I know the rest of you, if you can speak loudly and clearly uh, to the mic, please do so, because these masks really hinder, don't they, John? John? I, think, I think so. 
<laughs> John's struggling with his. But uh, I thought that was excellent, Stanley. We really appreciate that. And, you know, there's some positivity. And, and, you know, obviously we deserve some criticism, too. So if anybody has concerns or complaints, that's, uh, that's fine as well. But uh, next person, anybody like to go next? Charleston. Um, I've can, been a resident. Can you get closer to the sure. mic? Sure. Um, Donna Charleston. Uh, I've been a resident of Flint Carver in Edwardsville for about 30 something plus years. Raised three children um, at the uh, Edwardsville High School. And I guess one of my concerns that I see that has been continuous through my time here has been the fact that I don't see any black owned businesses in Edwardsville or Glen Carver. Um, I am not a native, um, but I have been here for 30 plus years. And I don't know if that's something that needs to be addressed with the chamber, um, with your local banks, or if you're telling me that there are no black people that want to own businesses in Edwardsville. But one of the concerns that I have seen um, throughout my time here has been the fact that there are no black owned businesses except for, I think, Gulf Shores. Um, um, but other than that, you know, why hasn't there been in my 30 plus years any businesses that are black owned in Edwardsville or Glen Carbon? And then in talking with my children uh, recently through all of this, I think one of the concerns that they have had, who uh, three of my children raised here, but three of them were eager to leave uh, because they did not think that Edwardsville was the place that they wanted to be. And so I think that there are some concerns that need to be addressed because you have a lot of, and their friends are black and white and of every race, but a lot of the younger kids that are graduating from high school um, and sorts are going to different locations, different schools, and they're not returning. Um, and so there has to, and because these kids are kids of, you know, well, now TikTok, but all these, you know, generations of, of online and stuff, they know there's another world out there. They know that there's, you know, whereas people that have lived here and not traveled much may not see that. These kids are, are young and they've, they've traveled out. And so they see there's a big difference sometimes. And that was one of the things that my kids and other of their friends said that when they leave Edwardsville, they see that it is a little different. That um, when they went to school and stuff, it's not that there's necessarily overt racism, but you just can feel it as a black child in Edwardsville, Glen Carbon, and being in school that sometimes you're not a priority. And I think that that needs to be addressed either through the, uh, the, the Edwardsville and Glen Carbon uh, uh, governments and also the school district because every child no matter what color should feel important and feel that they want to stay in their town that they were raised and I think too many of them um, that I have talked to recently and just talked through over the years feel like it's a nice place and they've loved living here but they don't know that they want to continue living here because when they've gone to cities like Chicago and just more urban areas they feel like it's a different kind of place to be, that there is a different kind of understanding that is there that's not here. So when you're forming your um, <laughs> questions and answers and stuff, maybe you think about some of the millennials that, because I don't see a lot of young people that are here. And I, um, I think that that speaks a little bit to um, why they're not here. You have black student associations, you have a university, you have all of that going on here, but I don't see outside of the younger kids protesting in the streets, I don't see them engaged in this kind of activity. And I think because they feel like it doesn't matter what they say, it's not gonna change at the public level or at the uh, governmental level. So why engage themselves in something that's not gonna change when they've been here and their parents have been here for 30 years and they see the same outcome over and over again. So that's my thoughts, thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Very good. Any other speakers just yet? Um, <clears throat> speak loudly, right? Can you, is, is the mic, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. My name is uh, Jerry Hedlund. I've um, lived in Evansville for over 40 years and um, uh, originally 
I grew up in uh, East St. Louis. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really just wanted to sit in the back and listen and, and sneak out of here. And, but, um, you know, I, 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 I just I retired a couple of years ago and worked in business for a long time. And there's, and there's so many things that, um, that where other people have found this, I think, the solutions that we need in the city so we don't have to recreate the wheel. I mean, my, my, one of my issues is when I go to the county or the city or look at the fire department or the police department, there's not many people of color that work there. And I, and I think about the fact that we've got SIU graduating all these people, and yet um, it just doesn't seem like the, uh, the, uh, at least the government or city employment re represents that population of, of people. We had the same problem where I used to work. Um, and one of the issues was we would be recruiting outside of the area for people. But not many people of color want to come and live and work in the St. Louis area because it's so racially polarized. And so, you know, we, we, you know I suggested to the people there, you've got to recruit locally. You've got to go to SIU. You've got to go to Flow Valley. You've got to go to the local college. You've got to go to people who already live here to get a chance of people wanting to come and work here. Um, we also, you know, instituted things like, you know, I'm. You know, as, as a manager, I couldn't uh, be the one to pick who I was going to interview as a candidate. We'd have an independent group look at the candidates so that there wasn't any bias in terms of me knowing them or having a relative know them or anything like that. And uh, we always made, sh you know, we, and we always looked to have uh, minority and women candidates and people of, of, um, um, involved in, in being part of those candidate pools. I mean, it's not wasn't necessarily the, like the Rooney rule in football, where, you know, where, where they look to have, make sure they have uh, minorities uh, when they're hiring for head coaches, but uh, it worked to help drive some positive numbers. And that's the other thing. I mean, the only thing that changes are things that you measure. So you, we have to start thinking about what kind of measures we can put in place to show, you know, what progress we want to make. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to know how many times the police are involved in a violent article altercation with somebody and, and I don't need to know the details about it but at least it gives me a sense of you know do we have issues like that in the city I don't I don't know um, I'd like to know what the numbers are in terms of you know when there are openings in the city or the county or the fire department or the police department and you know what are they are they actively looking for for all kinds of candidates to apply for these jobs I, I just don't know I'm in the dark so um, you know and uh, a young lady before me was talking about the kids, and you know, I had a child, you know, graduate in '93 from the high school, and, and another one graduate in 2013 from the high school, and, and it just seemed like the same old issues are, were always there in terms of not feeling comfortable, cult, you know, bias against minorities, um, preferences for some people and not others. So, um, I, I'm not, I'm not, and I, my, my last child who graduated in 2013 went through all 12 years with never um, a, a minority teacher, never a teacher of color to teach her in the 12 years she went through the school system. So um, anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I think what we could do, if you all would be willing to stay, I have, you know, the panel could answer some of the questions and kind of give you some insight. I know maybe not the forum right now. We'd rather listen for, to what you have to say. So please go ahead and do that. And depending on how late the evening runs, I could answer some of the questions. Not all. I, I, I took some notes, and uh, thank you, Jerry. Excellent input. Uh, next person. Speak strongly. My ears are getting weak. Yes, and I have, and my voice doesn't project. So That's together good. we'll have a problem. No, you sound good. <laughs> Uh, I'm Barbara Parker. I'm a lifelong resident of Edwardsville, so I've been here 70 years plus. <laughs> My father was a resident of Edwardsville, so um, I um, feel emotional because I really uh, had a very privileged life in Edwardsville. And I have lived abroad, I've lived internationally, and I came back to Edwardsville because Edwardsville raised me. Not just my mother and my father, but Edwardsville. And I really am sorry 
that everybody hasn't had that same experience. And it hurts me because I know how Edwardsville can take care of each other. And I really think that we all have to take a more active role. Um, the white people have to take a more active role in seeking people of color who are qualified as teachers, seeking people of color who are qualified for fire positions. That has to be an active stance that we're taking because the old system doesn't work. And the networking that the white people have access to gives them a privilege. And so we have to look outside of the regular networks in order to open the doors for black business people, for black firemen and policemen, teachers, whatever. And I, uh, I just feel very emotional. I'm very sorry that you haven't had my experience. It's a lovely place to be. Thank you, Barbara. Cornelius. Good evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing this evening? Well, yourself? Good. I'm sure you can hear me, am I correct? I appreciate that. I want to start by saying this. Uh, Kofi Anna said that ignorance and prejudice are the handmaidens of propaganda. Our mission is to com combat ignorance with knowledge, bigotry with tolerance, and isolation of an outreach hand of generosity. Racism must, will, and can be defeated. But it requires people with an open mind, a people to look beyond what they see and deal with what actually is taking place. And the reason I put it that way is simply because I have been here 15 years. And over the 15 years, I have gone in several of these businesses in this area. And the people look at me like I got three heads. And because of that, the conversation cannot go beyond, hello, how you doing? I make it a point to try to put people at ease because you cannot have a conversation until they're relaxed. But at the same time, you cannot continue the conversation if people will not extend to you an opportunity. You cannot expect for people of color to have opportunities if you will not extend that opportunity. And I know that for a fact because I have made the attempt. And I have been, not only have I been shut down, but I have also had some bad situations that happen to me. And I don't like that. I don't think you would like that as well. And it becomes an issue because you cannot grow your own population if you cannot get the support. Because here's the thing, white America, has a tendency to accept our money and take our money, but they don't want to extend their money to us. And as a result of that, you cannot have growth. With growth comes change. With change comes risk. With risk, you step outside of your comfort zone. And my question to you that are in here today, are you willing to step outside your comfort zone? Yes or no? Are you willing to step outside your comfort zone? Then if you wanted to step outside your comfort zone, then the people that have those kind of decision-making power must be present in order that they can participate so that if you exchanging dollars, then dollars must be exchanged on both ends. Not just you taking the dollar, but you must be giving dollars to others as well so that they in turn can grow their community and help other communities, which is what this is about. And this is no reflection upon me attacking anybody, but that is reality. And reality is what happens when you want to have a progressive community, everybody has to participate. Not just you taking my money, but you have to also give me 
money in terms of the products and service I provide. And not shut me down just because you see the color of my skin. I come to the table, not just me, but hundreds of other people come to the table with the capabilities, the education, the knowledge, the ability to communicate effectively. But yet you shut them down simply because you see the color of their skin. People, you have to move beyond that. Do not take this person. This is just from experience. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelius. Any other speakers? Next. So we've heard some about business. We've heard some about schools. Um, we've heard some about city government. That's what we're, uh, we're seeing in our questionnaire and uh, trying to look for those kind of patterns. Good evening. Good evening. You know, welcome to Edwards L. Stanley, the gentleman back there, 15 years. I've been here almost 70 years. And I plan on, I'm here tonight. I'm going to be here uh, July 8th, July 14th, wherever you're going to be at. I just want to listen. Get a little closer to the mic, please. Edwardsville. Thank you. Well, there, there's a lot of things going on in Edwardsville, and I just came just to listen. I'm going to listen tonight, the 8th and the 14th, and then I'll have more to say. I've got a lot to say about Edwardsville, a lot. So, thank you. Thank you. I went to high school here, uh, graduated in 95, and uh, my dad, he's retired now, but he was a teacher in East St. Louis, and he didn't want me to go to school in East St. Louis because he wanted me to be in a more diverse place. He wanted me to see things um, that a lot of other kids from East St. Louis wouldn't see. So we came to Edwardsville. Originally, I thought Edwardsville was somewhere by Chicago. I had no idea where it was. Um, but when I, when I came here, um, well, let me, let me go back. From Edwardsville, I went to Belleville for a, for a little while before we moved to Edwardsville. So when we, when we, when, once we got here, um, of course, my parents asked me, what's school like? Um, I said, well, so far, it's not too different from Belleville. There's some challenges. Um, I see a lot of... A lot of white kids hanging with the white kids, a lot of black kids hanging with themselves, and you got the mixture. Um, and growing up now, I like, I've, I've, I've moved to, to O'Fallon, uh, then moved back to Edwardsville. Uh, my little brother, he lives in Texas now. Um, his experience was in O'Fallon uh, was pretty much like it is in the area, not necessarily just Edwardsville or just O'Fallon, but this, pretty much this metro east area and he thought it was racist. And uh, so he immediately, once he got out of high school, he, he, he left, he, was, he, was, he went to Texas. Um, little story he told me when he first got to Texas, he and a friend of his was walking down the street, another, uh, another black male that he went to school with. Um, they were walking down the street together, they hear sirens. Well, immediately they, their mind thinks about where they come from, so they stop. Well, the police, had pulled over about three Hispanic guys behind him. From that point on, he said, hey, this, this, is, this, you know, this is what I'm used to, what I was used to, and now I see it with them. And he's like, you know, th this, this, this color that, that people, how they separate their feelings and how they separate people has got to stop because the majority of my friends that I went to school with in Belleville uh, wasn't in East St. Louis very long, but when I got here, are, st are still some of my best friends, white, black, um, one Hispanic, a couple, uh, couple Asian, but the, the, from what I can see from when I graduated high school to where in 2020, not much has changed. You know, racism is taught to the little kids. 
And it's, it's uh, I worked in school district here uh, a couple years ago. And, you know, with the, with the amount of black students and black residents that we have in Edwardsville, it's not represented in the school system. Um, I can think of one school in particular that has, I can't, I can't think of one black administrator or one black teacher. And, the, you know, the kids need to see diversity in school um, so, they, so they can understand what their futures can be. If they can't see teachers or administrators in school, then you know, then you know they, they have to they have to sort of dream big to understand what they can accomplish. Um, you know, I'm I'm also a, a a football and a basketball referee, and a lot of the complaints that we had from local coaches in this area was that the officials didn't match the players on the field or the players on the on the court. And I can just say from you know, sports perspective is that I think everybody wants everything to basically be called the same way. You know, they want to be treated the same, whether you're white, black, Hispanic, Asian, whatever. We all want things to be, we all want to be treated the same. We don't want to be, we, I've, I've been to places here, restaurants here, to where I've walked in, I've been the only black person in the place. And have been sitting there waiting on service for quite some time. And some people have come in behind me who were white and were served right, and right away. So that just, that just makes me feel that you don't want my business or you don't want my money. Now I've always been, I'm, in, I'm also an insurance. Now I've always thought that, you know, money has no color. Amen. You know, we all need money to survive. Everything's green. You know, you, if you, you know how can you, do, how can you can turn, turn away business you know, but just for the simple fact that you didn't want to serve someone based on the way they look, then you know th that's that's something that should be should, that the community should know know about. Um, last thought here, I was gonna um, my wife's a teacher in Edwardsville, and uh, she is she is adamant about diversity here. And uh, I was driving to work one day. Uh, actually, I, we were, I dropped her off and uh, on my way to work. We were actually driving right here on this main road. And the city had put up some banners of military people from Edwardsville. And there was not one black person on that city street. Now, I know I'm not crazy. There's a lot of black people that live in Edwardsville and have been, been in Edwardsville for quite some time that served in the military. And there's not, a, there's not, I, I can understand how we didn't see one black person face on, this, on the city streets as I was driving to work. And the statue that's been in the news, that I had no idea who that was. Um, I originally thought Edwardsville was named from a governor. But, um, I mean, if that's an issue to people that live here, who's been here 50 years, 70 years, whatever, you know, that's, a, that's another topic of discussion that definitely needs to happen. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Edward. Any other comments this evening? You sure can. It's an open mic. We're just hanging out with each other. And listen to what everybody's been saying tonight and the follow up on what he's saying about the military stuff. I'm a SARS V5 military. And what I get since I've been in Irisville. The information system we have is, is a bad system because all the reason I need about this meeting, I check my emails every day. And some people don't have the capability to check emails or just phone through their phone, whatever, and see what's going on. So that's how I got here because I read the emails, oh, a meeting. So what I'm saying to the people, community of Brazil, black and white, you know, and I heard one, the, even the aldermen say, well, we set up meetings, but nobody shows up. Look around right now. Look at this. Nobody here. So I mean, so the concern is you don't either don't care about your city or you just don't want to be bothered because like I said, I come from a small town. When I grew up outside of Rolex, it was almost a black community. I was in the fourth grade by myself until I was only kid in fourth grade black. Until about maybe mid year or my first grade year, well then a black student showed up. 
So I grew up in a small black community, but we were separated with school systems. We went to the, anybody on the west east side of the main street, we went to Bunker Hill. If you live on the west side, you went to Southwest. And I'm like, what the hell? We live all together. So far is maybe 50 students being segregated and bus to different schools because you don't be bothered or by one school. So I see what we're saying here in Eversville Gun Car because, as this man say, you're trained to, to see things. It's all about your leadership in your home. If you have bad leadership, you're going to be a bad person because leadership shows you what you're looking at. It guides you through your life. I had good parents. I tell anybody, I had a peaceful childhood. I had seven siblings. We got along. But they had trouble in the school system where I grew up out at Southwest and Bunker Hill. So I can understand the racism very, very well. So it's up to the city leaders to give more information. I know you're saying about the billboards and everything, but there's a way you need to do better communication energy just so everybody can have this information. You know, we need a better communication system for information because you get left behind if you don't have the information. Thank you. Good evening, you all. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Laika Hindi. I am not a native of Edwardsville. I'm a native of Staunton, Illinois. I um, grew up there as a person of color. I, my husband and I just moved to East Alton recently, like within the last five years we've had our house. And I teach in East St. Louis Lincoln Middle School. I'm a sixth grade math teacher. My question, I have a few different things. I didn't plan on saying anything because I thought this place was going to be packed. And I <laughs> wanted to hear what everyone had to say. Um, but as a teacher, I write down my notes. And, you know, <laughs> everyone's got to say something. Um, my first thing was, I, I don't know much about the police in the Edwardsville community. I just am interested to know if there is any, um, like, building relationship between the police and the communities. Because I think that could be a huge impact. I was on the Zoom meeting with the chief and everything like that um, last week. I just think that that would be very impactful for kids to realize that it, they're not there to hurt them, they're there to help them, just as a teacher speaking. Um, the second thing that this is kind of more for the audience, if anyone has any ideas on how to bring people that ride the fence, because there's either people that totally 100%, they got us, they support us, or people that are just totally against us, I don't think we're truly going to change their mind. I think that we need to really focus on the middle of the ground people because that's the majority. That is who we can grasp and who we can bring in and who we can get them to understand what people of go color go through on a daily basis. Um, so if anyone has any ideas, my only idea is I've just, I used to do the yelling and the arguing and the crying with my, um, so I have white family and I have brown family. And my white family tells me to sit down and shut up because I don't know what I'm talking about. Obviously, my brown family is un uplifting. But I, I used to scream and argue and yell with them and tell them what I go through or t tell them what my students go through, and it doesn't work. <laughs> um, I've recently turned the corner and become a much more calm individual when it comes to those because them seeing all the emotion just, they write you off automatically. So I've become much more of a um, just talking to someone in a calm way, well, why do you feel that way? What, just, like, just as I would de-escalate my students, I de-escalate their comfortability, I guess. Um, so if anyone has any ideas, I'm really interested in hearing that. Uh, and my last thing, obviously, as a teacher is the school systems. So I have a lot of friends that have worked in the Edwardsville school systems, um, very, very few that still work here for the reason that a lot of people have talked about. Uh, I don't know if people know, but it, it, Edwardsville has a lot of racially motivated, just a few instances I can think of, there were racially motivated chants at one of the schools here that got swept under the rug. The kids got no consequences. The principals were basically on their side. Their teachers laughed along with the students doing the chants. And that is such an uncomfortable feeling. I can't imagine how the students of color felt in that room 
in the cafeteria actually that day. And not only that day, but every day thereafter having to walk into that cafeteria. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, it was, one of them was build that wall and there was a few others, obviously not right along with what we're going with, but still racially motivated, still racist going on in Edwardsville. Um, there was obviously some stuff that went along at the high school that I'm sure a lot of you all know about, which was highly inappropriate. And it just breaks my heart to know that our students have to go through this because for a lot of the white people, it is something that happens on that day and they go, wow, that's horrible. They may stand up, they may not, but they go about their day where our babies of color, they don't get to go on. It's ingrained in them. So that is one thing I think really needs to be stressed from the city officials down to, I mean, even down to curriculums, diversity curriculums, even down to diversity trainings for the teachers where they actually understand the impact. Not where you're just sitting there goofing off with your friends, because believe me, I'm a teacher, I do that sometimes too during trainings, but where they're actually learning and actually are behind what we are talking about. Because what they are teaching these kids is inappropriate. It's just, it's, it's wrong. It's not everyone, obviously, I'm not putting everyone under the same umbrella by any means, because I don't want anyone to do that to us. But it, it needs, it highly needs to be addressed. Um, let me see if I'm forgetting anything. Um, SIUE in itself is also known to be a such a racist community of a college. All my black friends from East St. Louis are like, oh, you went to SIUE? Oof, oof. And I, I, had no, I had no idea. And just hearing their stories from SIUE in itself as a higher education was just baffling to hear their stories. Or even just living in the community. One of my friends, she said she got called the N-word at least three or four occasions just walking into her house carrying her groceries. You can obviously guess that she doesn't live here anymore. We need these people that do these wrong things to not just have a slap on the wrist. For the for teacher not to pull the student aside and say, you know, that was wrong because this, this, and this. I get where you're coming from, but, and then move them along their day. It's not okay. Because that person of, the person of color that it happened to, it haunts them for the rest of their life. And that little conversation did nothing. So we don't just need slap on the wrist. Our babies, they need justice. Um, I guess that's all I have to say. Anyone else? Committee members, would you like to address them? John? Uh, I've uh, been in the NAACP for, I guess, the early 90s, and uh, here in Edwardsville. And I've always been an officer of some sorts. And so, the NAACP is an being brought concerns about social injustice. And a lot of it is centered around actions taken with respect to race. That's what the person feels when, you know, they call me on the phone. Um, our first way of starting to address the issue is to be honest and acknowledge that we see color. When, whenever I'm in a meeting with people and they try to say, well, I'm a fair person, I don't see color, they surprise when I say, well, I do. And I understand how to react to it. Racism is a learned behavior. But it's one of the least address issues in our humanity. We don't talk about it. We act as though uh, until those moments that affect a person uh, directly uh, that we won't engage it and we allow ugly things to be said and we won't challenge the people that are saying them. Uh, so we, we, we allow it to occur 
because maybe the people don't feel like it affects them. But today, it's been put in front of our eyes that we need to change the climate of our country. And most of us as citizens know that mo the impact of racism impacts you directly in your local community. And we're all focusing on the uh, national leaders and hoping that something will be done by them. But it's us who fail to react to the injustices, whether local or the national level. And I'm not just talking about voting. You have to advocate with those people who you put in office, like the mayor. He's opening up the mic. Well, since I've been in NAACP as president, I have asked our citizens to participate in the governance of our community. That means be active, like you who decided to come out here tonight and you look in the room and you don't see a reasonable amount of people and we could come up with a million reasons why not. But if citizens don't start being active, then things are going to stay the same. This moment will pass and will one thing change. It was Bill you ha has to look at itself, and the mayor evidently wants us to, and he wants to hear from the citizens. But I'm sure he can look and see some things about Edwardsville he should scratch his head about. Uh, maybe he carried on the status quo. You all know well that the aldermen have committees and they have meetings. And when they do, it's probably few of, of in, any citizens that come out to participate. Uh, when we have school board meetings in this city, there are very few people in the audience except for the parents who came there because their children are being recognized. And soon after that happens, they're gone. And so the heart of the school board meeting does not have parent ears in there. So if we want to change Edwardsville, we have to challenge each other. We have to recognize that we have a responsibility to have the, the uh, conversations that need to take place. We all, many of you may go to church. Race is probably never, ever spoken of in church by our religious leaders in a manner that addresses the way we treat each other or suggests that we ought to do better in our relationships. But we're the ones who don't bring it up. We sit there quietly every Sunday and listen to the same stuff and we don't see where we should change how we live and how we treat each other. Now, I... Say again? Well, you have to realize I, when I say something, it's not global. It's not a, a truth. But in most of the churches I've been in, I don't hear that. Now, you may be privy to someone who is conscious of a, a racial concern. I would suggest that not the norm. I mean, we didn't have to see George Floyd get murdered. No, I mean, please remember my remarks are esoterical. Yes. All right, yeah. And uh, I, I appreciate... Hmm? One more time. I'm a board member of the Lincoln School of Mind and Nonviolence. And we get off of my table for the last 31 years to Edwardsville High School. So I question why I have a high school.
oldest brother is 69 years old this year. So what you said happened 50 years ago in small town America. So that's the difference of leaving big town America. You come to a small town community where you're going to have a few of us around here. So that's not in the textbooks to teach that because when I was in high school, well, hell, I didn't know who Fred Duck was. I got left high school. We didn't, like you say, it wasn't in the books. Didn't know the black man invented stuff like you read. So I agree with her. It's been going on for over 60 plus years, as everybody knows. All people here know that we've been left behind as far as education. And it's still here because they don't want to teach it. They don't want you to know that the black people were smarter than the white people sometimes. They had to do things to learn from us to make America great. To where we are now, the black people done everything, but we don't know that. Because we wasn't taught in the history books. It was torn out the pages, and we didn't get that. And I'm talking from experience. I'll be 60 this year, so I know what she's talking about. It's been 70 years that we've never been taught nothing like that. And I keep hearing that racism is taught. So if, if parents are teaching their kids the wrong thing, then it's our job as teachers or your jobs as city officials to make them teach it. It has to be a curriculum. We have to have training. If these kids, they deserve it. If, if the parents won't do right, we have to do right for the babies. I think we're losing your voices at the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I can uh, hear everybody fine. <laughs> but they're for the recording purposes. Yes. Yeah. That was my reference. Right. So we can hear, we can listen to it and learn from it. Uh, I'm glad to see so many. Those of you that spoke out, the things you shared, I appreciate. Uh, thank you very much. Jean, did you have anything? I love this idea about uh, diversity in our curriculum, changing and fixing and integrating the curriculum. Welcome to the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can speak to a few things. Um, we have some time left. And, you know, I, I think it is, um, one of you mentioned at the mic that it, it's pretty sad. The comment "Welcome to the '60s." It is sad that we haven't made more progress, and I think it, some of it is a, a lack of effort. Uh, some of it is a, a lack of um, desire to make that effort by some, uh, and others is it's just uh, you know we're busy. We think everything's fine. We look. We don't look at the details, and when we're not uh, hearing these kind of details, I mean, John mentioned it: getting involved, uh, speaking up to government, speaking up to school boards. Um, for the last seven years, I've had an open mic at every city council meeting, and I've taken every single phone call and offered to meet with anybody that called the city in a private meeting. So sometimes, you know, we miss things. We don't pay attention to the details in the areas that are surrounding us and affecting more residents than we ever imagined. So um, I'm sorry. You know, I think it's it is a, a failure, but when I go back to our statement, uh, my statement earlier that we all have a responsibility, uh, we do, and it's a daily responsibility. So um, I, I appreciate the questions that I've highlighted. You know, I guess what saddens me a little bit, and I don't want to put them under the spotlight, but um, I think Dr. Hightower was a pretty amazing individual, what he accomplished in his life and um, the job that he did here at, at District 7. And I know it was his goal to diversify both administration and to hire teachers. Um, I'd like to talk with him privately, or maybe he'll speak publicly about the challenges that he had um, in, in being able to do that. Um, I know that um, he had a lot of support, he has a lot of admirers, and uh, put a heck of an effort forward. So I can kind of, you know, parlay that uh, a little bit, answer some questions about our police department. When I see you're absolutely right. We do not have enough diversification within employment of the city of Edwardsville. Um, that is something that I will absolutely focus on here moving forward. Uh, I've been able to only appoint one individual um, that, uh, of color to our administrative team, but it was the first individual of color to be appointed to the administrative team, and that was Walt Williams. Um, only had another person get to the interview stage, 
that I would have an opportunity to do that. And uh, because of different reasons, uh, being near the end of her career and needing this position to be more of longevity, um, I didn't give her the opportunity. But, you know, I do have 10 months left in my term, and I look, look forward to having some other opportunities. I've got one in mind right now that will be out um, for applications within a couple weeks. So that would be an, an, an appointment of my own. Uh, on the police department side, we do have an independent board of citizens that do the hiring and the firing. So I do not fire police officers, nor does the chief. It's done by the Board of Police and Fire Commissioners. I do appoint those individuals. Uh, currently, we have two females and three males. We have one African-American and four Caucasians on that board. Um, they have gone out to try to diversify our police force, and it's a challenge. Uh, individuals, if you look at the consortium, what we hire from, it's a group that you get a graduate, you get a degree in criminal justice, and you take uh, a test and a physical, and you're put on a list uh, to look at about 10 communities that work in the consortium. And they take those individuals at the top of the list and work their way down. And of a list of 80 folks, we might have three that are African American on that list. And oftentimes they're taken fairly quickly by municipalities that are trying to diversify the workforce and have that opening. So we changed things um, about a year and a half, two years ago. And this was uh, a push by Dr. Hightower and several other the NAACP. And, uh, we decided to go for lateral hiring. So instead of having the young graduates and this list and this physical test and seeing which community they would get uh, picked from, uh, we decided to hire lateral officers, meaning if you're an officer in Belleville, you're an officer in St. Louis, you're an officer in Chicago, um, you can apply for the next opening at the city. And we went out and we spent $5,600 advertising in those communities uh, within their associations of police. Um, Chicago, Champaign, and, and St. Louis. And uh, we had one candidate, one applicant, uh, made it to the interview, and the Board of Police and Fire Commissioners, because of a background check, decided not to hire that individual. We were disappointed, of course. You know, we're, we're trying to do some things in that arena, but it takes all of us. It takes getting that word out. And I think somebody said it earlier, you know, it's hard to be that first, per we have two African American officers out of 43. So it's hard to come into an environment where you feel welcome. You know, you, you talked earlier about minority businesses. Sometimes minority businesses don't feel comfortable here because there aren't other minority businesses. Sometimes there are not enough minority uh, customers that might frequent that minority business. There's, you know, it, it, there's a little bit of first in, I think, threat amongst some of these problems that we're having. Uh, but. We need to do better. I mean, there's no doubt. The, the percentage that we have is one of the first uh, details I shared with the commission members was the city employment. And just for your knowledge, I, I don't have it in front of me, I'm, I'm thinking it was 4.3% when our minority population is closer to 10. Um, so that's woefully low. Uh, our population, just so you know, does include the SIU population. We count those students as residents. So we have a little bit higher minority population than you may see going up and down the street. And it's because the SIU students are, are counted in our um, population and in our diversity. Uh, but still, it's a, it's a low number. It's something that, that I will push uh, to do better with. And we've kicked around some ideas of how to increase um, the applicant pool and how to get good applicants in of minority. Um, so recruitment and also uh, possibly a position of diversity in, in, within the city that would help us uh, address that. If I could, uh, on the military banner, uh, mostly right there, except uh, one of my best friends uh, was on one of those banners. And uh, Kelly Dumas is a person of color who served the Air Force for 20 years. And uh, he was up, wasn't on the street maybe that you saw. He was actually in front of Cleveland Heat uh, because I remember specifically where his banner was. But that's not enough. You're, you're absolutely right. We need more. There have been way more veterans than that. The way that went was uh, our current city administrator, this is his, uh, was his first full year last year, and he uh, is retired Air Force, and he thought, you know, he's seen these banners in other communities, and can we do it here? And so we put that program out, the, the paper was nice enough to help us with the announcement. Uh, there was a fee of $100 to get a banner made, and then if you put the, 
brought the fee in and had the picture, then that banner will be used in cycles, you know, throughout the veterans, um, the veterans day and, and other holidays. So that's a little bit there. It's, it's not a great answer. Diversity of the school. I mean, I, I, I wrote that down and we're seeing that a lot. Um, and I think someone said, you know, the white people have a network that gives them an advantage. And that, that run home with me. Uh, you're absolutely right. You know, when you know who to call and you know who to communicate with, um, that, that network is something that we need to build. Uh, we've talked about with Walt Williams, our economic development director, having a, li a list of black businesses. There's, there's more than was announced here tonight. I mean, I, I know there's a dozen that come off my lips when I think about it, but there's also smaller ones you know, that do lawn care. A good friend of mine, um, African American, does lawn care and maintenance and tree removal. Um, but that being said, we need to have a list at the city so that there can be more networking so black businesses can get the word out that they would like to have more customers and they would like to have the same network and the same advantages that uh, white people do here in the community. So taking a note on that and then uh, just, you know, calming and working together. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. Please reach out to me. Please reach out to your alderman. Please attend these meetings. We have two more of these coming up. And uh, I'm going to try to get more aldermen to attend this. I know that some of them are planning on watching it because um, we're taping this tonight. But um, that, that's the best way to stay engaged. And I, you know, I think, Sam, you said it. We need to have calm. We need to work together. Yeah. We need to realize this is a problem. It is. And uh, we need to take action. Oh, one more thing. You know, on since we're talking about the low numbers, I don't know, every business has cameras around here, right? And I watch the programs, and there's the call, it's mystery shopping. So if we're having problems with the people not sponsoring their business, every business has cameras in it. So what you do, if you want to take some data information on how many people go in the businesses per week, per day, per month, then you know what the problem is. That way you can ask the, the owners, hey, how many black associates do you come to business today? Well, we don't know, we'll check the cameras. Yeah, and we talked about that as a committee uh, last meeting. We are doing these three sessions with public input, and then we're specifically going to engage the religious community through pastors and churches at a separate one, and then we're going to engage the chamber and local businesses, including an invitation to all our minority business owners, and then we're going to follow that up with a third group, and that's realtors. We hear a lot about the cost of living in Edwardsville and the affordable, lack of affordable housing, and so if we can get with the realtors and get with people that want to speak about that issue, that's uh, also something that we need to address. And after we collect all this information and use the questionnaire and the feedback on the questionnaire, uh, we plan on writing a summary. Uh, this group will write a summary statement um, and make recommendations to the city council. That sounds good because data makes sure you know where you're going. Exactly. All come out. Yeah, like somebody said something about the measuring stick. You can't, I think he's in the back. You, you, you can't know where you need to go until you know where you're at. And from there, you have to set a plan in place to be able to accomplish, um, you know, move these numbers in the positive direction. So any other, Brittany, you have anything? I know. I, I was really, so I'm, I'm from St. Louis. I'm from um, suburbs of St. Louis. And, you know, listening to some of you guys' stories, just to be brief, I've never come into a city and felt what I think of are, are microaggressions. Micro instances of, of people who seem like they don't understand me, don't understand why I'm in the position I'm in, and feel empowered to treat me as that way. And, you know, I, I'm here to learn and I just appreciate what you guys have said because it has, it has definitely been a struggle for me as an editor in Edwardsville for now about two years. Um, so although I'm a bit of a transplant to the community, as, as a, a leader, I would say, um, at least for journalists, and I would hope in the city, um, I, I, I resonate with a lot of what you guys said. I appreciate everything you, you said tonight and um, I hope to do as much as I can, not only through, through my platform, but as a resident. 
um, to really share some of these experiences and unite people who feel these uh, microaggressions as I do, and it sounds like some of you do as well. Thank you. Well, we definitely appreciate everyone coming out tonight. Uh, we will announce the location of our meeting next week. Uh, we wanted to see what the crowd was like tonight. We want to create that atmosphere where we can all sit across the table and talk. And so we'll try to pick a venue that does that. And then I know that several of the panelists wanted to have a Zoom meeting as well because we did get some feedback of people who still don't feel comfortable leaving quarantine, you know, under the conditions of COVID. So uh, we appreciate uh, you being here tonight and we'll hang out for a few more minutes, uh, probably 10 minutes, just casual if you want to speak with us privately. And then uh, we'll have a little summary before we leave this evening, okay? I'd like to give you guys a hand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming out.